Okay, Mr. Marshall. Uh, we are live. We are recording. You are the co-host of this meeting. Uh, you have nearly a full house of board members. Amherst Media is here with us. I think we're good to go. Okay. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. <clears throat> No. All right, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 1st, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting. Or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. I'm here. Fred Hartwell. I am here. We do not have Jesse May Major with us at the moment, and we don't expect him later either. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Present and Karen Winter. Present. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remem remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined a Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be discontinued from the meeting. Okay, first item tonight uh, are minutes. Uh, the time is 6.36 and we have the minutes from March 6th. And Chris, am I not correct that you also sent us the minutes for March 20th? I did send you the minutes for March 20th. I think I sent them yesterday, so you may not have had time to review them. Okay, well, why don't we go through the March 6th minutes first? Uh, board members, uh, does anybody have any edits to those minutes? Uh, Bruce? I'm not sure whether it's an edit or not, but uh, in the site visit report portion, uh, I'm not sure what page it's on, but uh, I could quickly find out. However, there's uh, six items, and the number six items, I, I delivered the report, and the number six item attributes me to saying that uh, there was a preference for four-story buildings over five-story buildings. And I certainly don't remember saying that, but uh, maybe someone else did. 
or maybe, uh, but, but I just don't remember that being a discussion of the site visit, but am I wrong about that? Doug, Chris has got her hand up. Oh, Chris, go ahead. I think Janet said that. Ms. McGowan said that. Okay. I, I think I remember Ms. McGowan saying that she doesn't support five-story buildings, but prefers four-story buildings. Okay, it doesn't, it it doesn't seem Janet. like a site visit. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like something that should be said or recorded on a site visit. But is that, am I wrong about that? I mean, that's kind of uh, not just data collection. It's uh, yeah. opinionating. Should that be stricken? Any objections to striking that, anyone? Janet, particularly. I, I, hear, I, I hear no objections. Yeah, yeah I don't, I don't remember it. saying that, but I could have said it. I don't, you know. But. Yeah, we, I mean, we usually try to stick to observations in site visits. Yes, yeah. I don't, re I don't recall. Yeah. With that with that correction, I move acceptance of the minutes as presented. All right. Does anybody want a second at this point? I'll second. Thank you, Janet. Karen, sorry to miss you on that. Okay. Uh, any further comments or discussion? All right. Um, we'll go through the roll call. Um, all in favor, anybody in favor of adopting the minutes with that one uh, edit uh, should vote yes. Uh, Bruce? Yes. Fred? Yes. Um, Janet? Yes. Johanna? Yes. Karen? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Six votes in favor, one absence. All right. Um, do members feel that you have looked at the March 20th minutes adequately for us to discuss, discuss them tonight? Um, I'm seeing a couple of heads nod. Janet, your hand. You know, I read them and they're very short. So maybe if no one's, if someone has missed it, they could probably take a minute and go through them. Okay. Well, uh, I saw Karen and Bruce in favor of uh, discussing them tonight. Um, Fred and Johanna. Johanna's nodding yes and the thumbs up. Looks like Fred is the same way. So, okay, great. So, um, <clears throat> any comments on the? On the Jan on the March twentieth uh, minutes, no comments. Okay, well, in that case, uh, I will move that we adopt the the March twentieth minutes as drafted by our uh, highly capable staff. Uh, would anybody like to second that? I second. I second. Thank you, Karen. All right. Uh, any further conversation about those minutes? No. Okay. We'll go. We'll start with the end of the alphabet. Uh, last names. Uh, Karen. Yes. Johanna. Yes. Janet. Yes. Um, Fred. Yes. And Bruce. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. All right. So those minutes are adopted as drafted. All right. Thank you all. All right. Um, all right. So the time now is 641, and we will go on to the next item, which is a uh, public comment. I generally read the names of the public attendees that I can see at this point in the meeting. So I will read uh, the following names. We have Chris Chamberlain from Berkshire Design. Elizabeth Armstrong, Greta Wilcox, Jane Wald, Jenny Kallick, Fred, uh, Ken Rosenthal, uh, someone named Lauf, I believe, uh, Mark Andrews, Maura Keene, Melissa Ferris, Michael Lipinski, Pat Brinkman, Priscilla White, 
uh, Roger and Tim Widman. All right, so are there any members of the public who would like to make a comment on a topic that is not a specific item on tonight's agenda? I am not seeing any hands raised from the public. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna conclude there is no public comment tonight. So we'll move on to the third item on the agenda. Time now is 6.43 and we'll go to the public hearing, uh, a site plan review. <clears throat> So this is regarding S site plan review 2024-06 uh, at the Emily Dickinson Museum at 20, 214 Main Street in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A. This public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. The applicant is requesting site plan review approval under section 3.334 of the zoning bylaw to construct a two-story building approximately 1,630 square feet, including wood siding and metal roof, including incidental utility work at 81 Lessie Street and other site improvements. Parcel is located at map 14B, parcel 24 and 24 and 26 in the RG zoning district. First of all, uh, are there any, is there any board member disclosure? All right, so I will offer that uh, I am the son-in-law of one of the uh, members or uh, people associated with the museum who have given money to uh, build this building. So uh, I have filed a form with the, with the town clerk uh, regarding the uh, potential appearance of a conflict of interest. Uh, I don't believe I have a, a conflict. Um, the, the relatives who are associated with the museum have made their contribution and uh, that's a done deal. It, uh, so they won't have a financial interest in the outcome of this hearing. So uh, does anybody else have a uh, any disclosure. Okay, well, in that case, um, I see Chris Chamberlain has been brought over. Chris, are there other members of your team that you want to bring over onto the panel right now? Um, yes, uh, Tim Whitman, who's with EDM, the architect. Um, I heard his name in that list. Yep, Tim Whitman. Um, Pam, if you can bring Tim over. Trying to find him. There he is. He's the one with his hand up. I see it now. <laughs> I didn't go far enough up. He should be on his way over. Okay. Chris, is there anyone else? Um, I'll have to check with Tim. There's one other potential person from the architect's office. Um, okay. Hi, Tim. Uh, Hi. Yeah, Monica is not going to be joining tonight. Great. Okay. So it's just me. Great. All right. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think um, she intends to say anything unless a very specific question comes up, but uh, Jane Wald, the director of the museum, is on the call. I had invited her over, and she declined to yeah. come in as a panelist at this time. So she... okay. I think Tim and I can, can cover things pretty well, so that's fine. Okay. All right. I guess uh, welcome, Chris and Tim, and it's now time for your presentation. Great. Um, so, um, as, as was just mentioned, um, I'm Chris Chamberlain. I'm a civil engineer with Berkshire Design Group in Northampton. Uh, Tim Whitman, who is with EDM, uh, the architecture firm that's working on this project, uh, is here as well to talk a little bit about the building. Um, the property that we're talking about, which I'm sure the board is, is very familiar with the location, but is the Emily Dickinson Museum here on Main Street um, between Lessie and Triangle Street. Um, and as we look at an aerial photo, um, this is the building known as the Homestead, um, Emily's home uh, on the property. Uh, this building, which uh, was owned by her brother and his family, 
um, is uh, known as the evergreens. And these are the two main structures um, on the property. And uh, this sort of existing gravel driveway leads to the location of the project that I'll be showing on the plans uh, located roughly here. Um, strictly speaking, on the Evergreens parcel, while the museum treats this property as a single property, there are two separate parcels here. And a small portion of the work I'll note is on um, Amherst College land associated with the Marsh Hall building, which is located right here. Um, and as most of you are probably familiar, um, the both the Emily Dickinson Museum and Amherst College um, are under the umbrella of the trustees of Amherst College. So all of this work is sort of under the same ownership. Um, umbrella there. And switching over to the site plan, um, this is ultimately a relatively simple project. So we'll just briefly review um, some of the components. Um, and then I think we'll, I imagine we'll recap uh, a nice site visit that we had with board members yesterday, uh, yesterday um, and then be happy to answer any of your questions. So this is a, a bit of a zoom in of the Evergreens parcel. You'll see that Evergreens building poke, uh, peeking out from the edge of the sheet right about here. This is the existing conditions plan um, with the, the homestead building far off the page to the right. Um, this line here I'll note is the property boundary as I described between the museum property um, as, and the Amherst College land. And what you'll notice here that's sort of a, a significant item is uh, these uh, shapes here, which are noted as flat stones. And those are remnants of um, the foundation of a former carriage house that stood on this property that was the carriage house for the Evergreens building. You can in fact see um, a stone walk that leads directly toward where that carriage house uh, once stood. Um, and there's been some historic research uh, that, that can Tim can teach touch on a little bit if anybody's interested to sort of establish through uh, historic records, insurance maps, contemporary photos, and that sort of thing to try to establish where this building um, would have sat uh, back in that time. And before flipping to the proposed project and just showing that building, I want to highlight a couple of other things that are relevant. Um, there is an existing gravel walking path which uh, was constructed uh, not too long ago that connects with an accessible route the two main buildings on the property, the homestead off to the right and the evergreens. And as we saw in the aerial photo, this is that uh, dirt driveway uh, that leads up from Main Street on the evergreen side of the property. Um, and, um, and as you'll also note, this is a, a little bit relevant in terms of other reviews that we're going through. Um, there has been identified a uh, bordering vegetated wetland um, in this portion here. Um, the site is, has historically had a battle with water that seeps out of the hillside from the north to the south. Um, there's been extensive work uh, before uh, it was a museum and merely a residence in fighting water, trying to get its way into the evergreens. And so this seems to be a ditch that was dug to try to intercept some of that water and redirect it. And now it is a wetland resource area. And so the project that we're describing is within the buffer of that wetland. And we're currently working through the Conservation Commission process. Um, additionally, um, there is a, a significant tree on the site, this 24-inch pin oak. Um, unfortunately, this oak is, uh, and it's a little more obvious as members saw on site, is actually growing out of what we believe was the footprint of the original carriage house um, and as part of sort of the historic preservation reconstruction standards that museums held to. Siting of this building is gonna put it nearly directly on top of this tree. Um, so unfortunately, this is a tree that will be removed to serve the project, um, although we are proposing um, additional tree plantings to offset that impact. And so now looking at the proposed project, um, Tim will talk about the exterior of the building in just a little bit, um, but there's uh, there was uh, research to determine sort of the, the size and scale and construction and appearance of this building, um, which uh, is being uh, hewed to in accordance with um, some regulations that come down from the federal government, as well as a number of state uh, regulations and restrictions on this property to try to um, recreate the appearance of the carriage house as it originally stood. 
Um, but the purpose of this building is actually to serve as a welcome point initially uh, after its construction for the museum. So this will, will be sort of the welcome center for arrivals. Uh, it's going to include bathroom facilities, which are somewhat lacking on the property now. Um, and then ultimately, this building is uh, thought to um, serve as an educational space in the long term. Um, among the, the major site items that are associated with this building, probably the most prominent on the site plan is an extension of this dirt driveway, which is going to lead up to um, the sort of reconstructed uh, front doors to that um, carriage house in this location. Um, this serves two purposes. I mean, one, it's it's sort of historically appropriate for this driveway, which uh, would have run straight into the original carriage house to be continued up into the site. But also this location is somewhat distant from the existing ADA parking spaces that are available on site. Um, those spaces, uh, which are behind the homestead building off to our right, are more than 200 feet from this building. And um, by modern codes, that's too far away um, to, to be considered as serving this building. And so this driveway will be widened slightly from what may have originally been there um, 100 years ago uh, to create uh, an, an ADA compliant parking drop off space in this location here, which we will separate from sort of the rest of the site uh, with a couple of boulders. And this will allow for accessible access into the site, um, parking and or drop off uh, in this location with um, drivers able to then turn around and exit the site. And then you'll notice that that path sort of slims down more toward the 12 foot wide, uh, maybe even slimmer than that, um, original driveway that would have approached this building. And that gravel walkway that I um, highlighted before, which I'm tracing right now with my cursor, um, in order to give a little bit of breathing room from this building and ensure that we have proper drainage around it on this wet site is being um, realigned ever so slightly. Um, and what's proposed here is sort of a, a slight difference of material. Um, the driveway will be more of a, a typical gravel that you'd have on, on any kind of gravel driveway. Um, and then the lighter shading that you see here is all proposed to be a stone dust surface, which is what the existing gravel path is. And that's sort of the, the only not truly hard surface um, that's adequate for an accessible route. Um, and so this is sort of all integrated as the accessible walking surfaces as distinct from the uh, driving surface that comes into the site. Um, the uh, utilities for this building will be served. Um, water and electric will both be pulled out of the Evergreens building along a route running right here. Uh, there is some HVAC equipment for climate control located in this case. Um, that's all uh, relatively simple utilities. Drainage uh, for this building um, is being collected in uh, gutters with a couple of downspouts in this location. We are routing that to a proposed dry well that will be under the ground, not really visible from the surface. Uh, this is proposed to provide at least some level of infiltration, at least during those parts of the year when the site dries out to allow that water to have a first chance to infiltrate back into the ground. Um, but certainly during some times of the year, uh, there'll be limited ability to do that. And this structure overflows to existing drain lines that run into the site. Part of that water management story is uh, about 15 years ago, the museum went through a project that uh, incorporated a lot of drainage around the Evergreens building to dry out the foundation from the exterior. And um, below that gravel walking path, there's actually a, a continuous under drain, a perforated pipe that collects groundwater. And all of that uh, today is tied together and exits the site toward Main Street, where it ties into the um, municipal storm system. Uh, that's something we reviewed with DPW early on, um, and they, they were satisfied with that connection. And the last utility, which is really the most challenging on the site, is for sanitary sewer for this building. Um, as it turns out, to many people's surprise, Main Street fronting this property does not have a sanitary sewer, um, so there is no way to connect by gravity directly from this building out to the street. The Evergreens has a sewer service with it, which has been unused for about 20 years. 
Uh, the Amherst College tried to explore that pipe, found that it was likely failed, but at least blocked somewhere under town-owned land off to the east, but not within the right-of-way. Um, and in addition to that, would require trenching around the evergreens, really right along the edge of this wetland system here, um, as well as trenching on site, which triggers the possibility of archaeological reviews. So for all of those challenges, uh, what we looked at instead is a direction where uh, this uh, water would be collected in a small pump station behind the building and pumped up the hill and tie into the Marsh Hall uh, building, which you saw highlighted on the aerial photo. Um, uh, we've had that sanitary service explored. It's in great shape. Um, and we are uh, we have a route planned for that sewer to uh, run up the hill and then flow by gravity into the municipal system. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this project's going through CONSCOM. Uh, we've been in review on that for a little while now. Um, we have been working through a number of mitigation measures, uh, which are not, not terribly relevant to the site plan review. If members are interested, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, we are hopeful that we'll be drawing to a close next week um, on the CONSCOM review, um, which I think was also uh, mentioned by Chris in her uh, report um, to, the, um, to the board. Um, so those are sort of the highlights of the um, site plan. I know there's uh, some comments and questions that came up at the um, site walk and some from the uh, staff review, but uh, I'll stop there and just give Tim uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit um, just about the appearance of the building and the exterior and, and the architectural thought that's gone into this project. Okay. Um, as Chris noted, uh, we did do some rather extensive research, both ourselves and the museum, um, in terms of what was present on site, as well as in terms of where the existing carriage house was and what it might have appeared to be, um, both in terms of records in Massachusetts State's libraries, um, at various local colleges, and at the Library of Congress. Um, there were documents uh, related to its location, um, but very little related to its uh, general appearance. Um, I can show you some of the um, various documents that we have. We have gone through a uh, review with historical, um, and they are satisfied with the direction we're going. We are following um, their standards in terms of development. Um, and then have used, um, with our research from the Library of Congress, um, various carriage houses from Western uh, and Central Mass um, from similar time period um, to look at them from the standpoint of their shape, their size, and the general appearance that they have. As Chris noted, the carriage house is going adjacent to the Evergreens, and so Part of the effort in the design it has really been to take our cues from the existing building in terms of its materials. So we are going with a standing seam metal roof with the intent of that metal roof matching the color of the evergreens and then using a vertical siding um, which will be painted to match evergreens um, for the exterior. Um, that vertical siding, the intent is that that will be um, using boral, which is a fly ash composite product um, that is workable like wood, um, but is highly durable and will not have the same susceptibility to absorption of water and rot um, that a wood product would. Um, you're seeing now some of the exterior elevations um, that we've developed for the building. Your main approach to the building um, will be this one from the south, um, where you'll have a set of wider doors, six foot uh, opening with a pair of barn doors um, to give it that feeling of um, a carriage house. Our detailing in terms of the trim, as you can see in our documents, um, we are taking from the rear portion of the Evergreens building, um, the front, is highly ornate, but the towards the rear of the building, the trim is a bit more uh, restrained um, and simplified. And so we're using that as part of our uh, 
reference in terms of building the language of how this building is detailed. Um, in terms of the interior of the building, uh, just to note, which it was a discussion point yesterday on site during the uh, site walk, um, the first floor will have uh, two bathrooms, one of which will be fully accessible. Um, and as Chris had noted, the first floor will be primarily uh, community space um, as a visitor's, visitor center to start and then for educational purposes as time goes on. Um, and then the second floor is currently planned for office space. Um, and I would just note that that Tim mentioned um, the project's been reviewed locally um, by the historic commissions. It's also been reviewed um, at the state level by the Massachusetts Historic Commission, which holds a deed restriction over the property um, and has been designed to be in compliance with the standards set by the Department of the Interior at the federal level for historic preservation projects. And in this case, in particular, a reconstruction project. Um, and so right. um, with that, I, I think uh, we defer to the to the board uh, as to um, questions, comments, discussion. All right, Chris, I see your hand. Uh, you are muted. Yep. I wanted to clarify that this project went to the local historic district commission. And did it also go to the historical commission? Yes, I want to both of those. The ending is yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and Tim, I just uh, one point that also came up yesterday is the uh, the passive house standard. Yes, yes. So the building is being designed to be passive house, um, which essentially means that all of the envelope, um, the R values, the the insulation values rather that have been used and selected for windows, doors. Um, and the insulation throughout the building are much higher standard, um, which is going to allow for our uh, heating and cooling systems for the building to be that much smaller and efficient because the loads will be far smaller. Okay. Uh, so it, why don't we go to the report from the site visit? So... Um, Karen and Bruce and I were at the site visit yesterday, and Janet too. Um, sorry, Janet. And um, would any of you like to make the report? Okay. Well, um, I guess I'll I'll start, and you guys can fill in my my memory. Um, you know, we all we all gathered with Chris and Tim and. And, and Chris Brestrup too, uh, yesterday about 5.15. And um, we looked around at the site. Chris went, Chris went through a lot of the stuff he just talked about and pointed out the stones on the ground, the walkway coming out of the evergreens, uh, talked about the pretty steep slope for the drive coming up from Main Street, uh, the uh, the accessible parking area that they've planned, talked about the, uh, the dry well for the, for the uh, runoff from the building. And he pointed out the, the berm that's just downhill from the new ditch, or the, not new, but the ditch that was uh, created to divert water away from the evergreens. Um, we did... Uh, wonder about the project that came to the planning board a couple of years ago where there was new lighting planned uh, between the evergreen evergreens and the homestead and i'm hoping chris has found out about that in the last 24 hours um uh, that's what's coming to mind for me karen janet bruce anything else um i think i think it's really wonderful that this carriage house is going in because it will provide restrooms and uh, this place is going to become a lot busier it's it's been renovated in such a beautiful way and this is a historical building so so i like that idea i like the fact that it can be used for education 
it is very sad that that beautiful tree has to come down. Um, but that's the sacrifice. I mean, they will be planting others. There are still plenty of beautiful trees on the property. Um, yeah, I th I think it will will certainly not distract from what is there and and be a, a great addition. All right. Thanks for those observations, Bruce. And Doug, we also spend a moment uh, more um, inquisitively on the uh, drainage system, the uh, drainage from the roof to the dry well and the dry well to uh, the under drains, which then uh, are existing, which then uh, feed into the the street. And we understand that uh, the town engineer has not specifically reported on that and 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 we understood that uh, his principal concerns were that the conservation commission's interests uh, be respected uh, he has apparently reported on the sewer uh, but not the drain and and so we spent a moment just trying to imagine whether it seemed just for our non-engineering backgrounds to be satisfactory and and uh, it was observed that the uh, Basically, the what's changing is the the rain is hitting a roof, which is going to make it run off much faster. But the amount of water that's uh, ended up uh, flowing into those uh, uh, dry well and then overflow into the under drains into the town sewer, uh, town drainage line, at least on Main Street, is 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 would seem to be uh, uh, acceptably indifferent from the current situation. So. Uh, we did we did take the time to explore that in a little more detail. Okay, uh, Janet. Th thanks for taking the lead on this, Doug. Um, <laughs> we did talk we did talk about like how accessibility issues and how you get to the evergreens, and so the driveway that will be expanded is a steep slope from the. Um, from Main Street. And so that, you know, no one could, you know, with mobility issues really could easily get up that. And then, so the idea is that people could drive up, somebody could, you know, if they have a wheelchair, mobility issues, they can get out. There's no parking in that area by the evergreens. And then the, the car would, or the vehicle would have to back up a ways. I'm not quite sure how far in order to make like a turn and turn around. And um, some concerns were raised about the safety of that if people were using that driveway to walk up. And then we asked, because none of us who had worked on the original permit a few years ago could remember if it was accessible, if the slope coming up the um, walkway from Main Street to the Emily Dickinson um, house was like meeting accessibility standards. It, it's a gra more gradual slope. So that was a question that that I think I raised and Chris raised because we couldn't remember. Um I think that's it. Um, oh, and the, we discussed a bit the lighting, um, and the, there's no, there's not going to be any lighting. There's going to be two lights on the carriage house that are gooseneck kind of traditional lights that will only be on when the building is in use and not after that. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Chris, uh, do you want to? comment on a couple of the topics that were brought up here? Um, I certainly can. Um, Joanna has her hand up. I don't oh, know if you oh yeah. First. Okay, Johanna, yeah. go ahead. Thanks. Um, thank you. I appreciate so, being a part. So, so this, we're, we're, are we done with the site visit conversation? The report on the site visit. Okay. Uh, so now we're going into questions from the board. Okay. Go ahead, Johanna. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you for the presentation. My question has to do a little bit with the master plan for the site and whether there is one. So I remember a couple of years ago doing the site visit and um, discussing the upgrades for the museum and approving the walkways that are in place now. I think I vaguely remember the discussion of the carriage house at that point, but I'm wondering if there are you know, in the coming years, additional projects that the museum is intending to pursue in order to bring it back to its historic glory. 
Okay, Chris. So there were sure. two or three things brought up in the site mm -hmm. visit and then Johanna's question. Great. And fortunately, I can address all of those at this point. Um, so uh, first, the lighting. Um, so astute observation on the, on the spur of the moment yesterday. Um, the project that established that gravel walking path did propose lighting. Um, I talked with Jane Wald uh, earlier today. And so the lighting that was proposed for that path has not been installed yet. Um, there have been a series of issues with that, the first of which was difficulty working with the contractor as the pandemic set in as that project was underway. Um, and then um, the Evergreens uh, building was renovated for their HVAC system, uh, which created disruption to the ability to pursue the, the completion of that lighting project. And then with the imminence of the carriage house project, um, the museum felt that it was more appropriate to wait until that plan was fully developed and approved and then sort of take a step back and confirm that the goals of the lighting plan uh, would jive with um, those changes now that they're a little bit more real. And so the museum is still intending to complete that work, um, but uh, but sort of wants to take a second look to make sure that it's uh, exactly what they want. And should there be any changes, of course, that would have to come before the board um, to verify it. So I, I guess um, if there's concern about that lighting not existing and now the museum moving on to a new permit, um, perhaps that's something that could be addressed in, um, in a condition of this permit. The museum's still uh, interested in completing that, but, but have had a series of events lead them to not do that just yet. Um, the accessibility question. Um, so the museum as a whole has had an ongoing process over many years of trying to improve accessibility on the site. Um, as is obvious when you look at it, uh, this site was never developed with the intention of be it being ex accessible. That word didn't even mean what it means today uh, when it came to be. Um, and so fighting that elevation change from the street uh, into the site and into the buildings has, has been a long-term challenge. The driveway up to the homestead building does, uh, does not meet um, full ADA or Architectural Access Board accessibility, which would require it to be less than 5%. Um, it is somewhere around 7 or 8% coming in. Um, what I would say, is, to, to borrow a term that Bruce has used, is at this point it provides functional or practical accessibility to a certain extent, if not full compliance. Um, what the museum has done is established the um, existing accessible parking spaces directly behind the homestead. Um, they have developed the accessible route through the site, which connects the homestead with the evergreens. And it also connects to a property adjacent to the site over on Triangle Street, 20 Triangle, which itself also has an accessible parking space at it, which is available and there's signage there directing an accessible path toward the museum. Um, and uh, of course, this project is going to establish an additional um, accessible uh, point where um, people can come onto the site, which connects to that system. And the museum has on hand uh, conceptual designs for um, improving accessibility to the public way of the sidewalk on Main Street. That is a goal of the museum to establish um, that uh, that connection, it has to be done very carefully in order to uh, weave itself in with the various uh, historical restrictions and standards that are held to this site. Um, they had previously explored both for the purpose of accessibility and to improve access for the fire department, actually flattening the homestead uh, driveway, but the grades are such that they would actually need to lower the entire parking lot, which then creates accessibility issues into the building, in addition to being quite a lot of work. So that is is probably not a route that could be achieved. Um, and I would also note that with the sort of activation of the driveway at the Evergreens, it does create a potential opportunity 
for a pedestrian path that's oriented more toward downtown that could gradually enter the site um, and make that uh, make that grade up in an in an elegant and accessible way as one possibility in the future. So um, and and then I would say in addition to that, uh, many of the projects the museums pursued have gone before the Architectural Access Board. Uh, working with a historic property, there are often uh, conflicts between historic preservation and modern codes, um, and they've successfully um, worked through the process with the Architectural Access Board to provide uh, the best accessibility that they can at this time. Um, and then, sorry, I can't answer any question without six answers. Uh, in addition to that, the museum website also has a page on accessibility. So anyone planning a visit to the site um, is made aware of the accommodations that do exist and the limitations of the site. Um, and I think I would just summarize that by, by saying that I think it shows a pretty good track record of a commitment to continually improving the site with a goal of full accessibility, um, but not a goal that, that can be achieved overnight, unfortunately. Um, and sort of that touches a little bit on Johanna's uh, question is there is long term planning for the grounds and the site. Um, uh, the next project that is likely to come along uh, that would be, you know, sort of visible from the exterior uh, is to establish a historic garden that was present on the site, which is a little bit east of where the carriage house is now. Um, there are two large tulip poplar trees that uh, that the research suggests uh, marked an entryway to that garden. Um, and there's actually um, an, an old water spigot in that area, which uh, presumably is a little bit more contemporary than the original um, garden. But that's uh, that's likely to be um, a project that they pursue in the relatively near future. All right. Um, Chris, uh, I, I, I think I want to correct one thing. I think you mistakenly said the uh, sewer line from the Evergreens that has failed uh, is actually heading west from the Evergreens. Yes. Not east. That's correct. OK. All right. Um, so I had, uh, I don't see any other hands at the moment. So I'll ask just a couple of quick questions. Um, first of all, for the back, for the uh, sewage sewer line that's being pumped up the hill to Marsh Hall, um, I assume there's a backflow preventer on that of some sort that if, uh, that, that we wouldn't have sewage running downhill and into the building because of the gravity. Um, that's correct. The, um, the, the exit point of the pump uh, in a system like this always includes a check valve um, to prevent the water from running back into the pump station. Uh, on short runs, sometimes that's not included and you actually do let the water drain back so that the pipe is not full uh, because that is a little bit of a freeze risk. But on a long, long run like this, we, we just bury it deep enough that that's not an issue um, and then, and then okay. uh, provide that. All right, and then uh, the last two questions, maybe for Tim. Um, several of the photos you showed of examples of this of this type of building showed the you know sort of the the barn doors uh, were underneath the ridge of the roof, um, and since it seems like you don't have uh, actual knowledge of which way the ridge ran on the original building. Uh, how did you decide which, which the, how you've done it? Because clearly, you know, you, if you get a heavy rain, the way you've got it now, the gutters can overflow and you can get dripping on people coming out of the building. So I'll answer with two things. So first of all, yes, you're right. The ones that I showed, because I was quickly skimming through. Um, historically, a lot of them do place them underneath the gable. Um, there are others where they are um, actually on the side and actually using this um, more historical um, architectural rendering. Um, this is one of the major influences that caused us to move in this direction um, is looking at um, this as a more uh, traditional um, root cellar slash uh, carriage house sort of approach. Um, as well as orientation of the building towards the south um, so that we can get um, more south facing on the building, um, which is both better from the standpoint of um, this, the sun and the visibility, as well as um, 
future for if there's any availability for any sort of other passive systems to be instituted for the building. Okay. Um, and Tim, actually, if, if just to hold that point, if you would stop sharing for a moment, there's yeah. a there's another image that um, uh, I can share. Um, I was not part of this research, but I I did uh, have it, so I don't know exactly um, mm. what what this uh, where the this originates from. But uh, as you can see, this is an image of the neighborhood with the evergreens right here, and uh, this is a depiction of the carriage house as it stood at one point in time. Great. All right. So then the last thing I was going to ask was about the window mullion patterns that you yes. are using. Um, they look to be a little more dense than the evergreens. You know, you have six over six or, and the evergreens was more like four over four. So the evergreens is actually varied. Um, it has a variety of um, four over four, there's also six over six. We have used um, more than uh, six over six, um, which are what is present at the rear of the building, which we're taking as our sort of touch point of reference in terms of how we're tying to um, the evergreens, which the rear portion is where we're adjacent, where that ramp comes in um, from the side. Okay, great, thank you. Bruce. Um, this, on the site plan, there's uh, maybe you can bring it up, but I've got mine here. It's something I didn't notice yesterday, and this simply says on the western side, um, there's, uh, um, you know, I, I just can't help noticing that this looks like a one legged guy playing football, but I haven't <laughs> noticed that until it's like about half now an hour. Now it's all ago. I'm going to be able to see. <laughs> <laughs> but on the western side, it's, you've got. Uh, step tbd and you've been so precise about everything else and it's mm. the step is it so what does that mean is it you mean you don't know whether you're going to have a step there or and it's a grading issue or you haven't decided what the material is that it's going to be made out of so i uh well so there would be a door pad there i believe i'll defer to tim on that i think the answer is we submitted these plans in february and we weren't sure whether there would be a step off that pad or not at that time yeah i mean and I... it is also something that may shift um because hmm. there's still i think some uncertainty as to what will happen with the with the stone path that i highlighted on the on the site plan yeah because I was, uh, I was thinking that maybe what you would be doing was be using the stones that you will be picking up from around the footprint of the new building, and consolidating them as a porch, uh, as a porch patio in front of that door. Um, but I was just curious. Um, the, I, I think that's a, 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 a enough. I mean, I don't guess I really need to know, but it seems that it's a visual uh, piece here and. Uh, Everything else you've been so precise about. Yeah, um, so Tim, I, do, I don't know if you have. Uh, I assume you know because we're we're closing in on construction documents as to what the final treatment we've decided there. Um, at least in terms of materials. In terms of material, I actually don't. I would assume it's going to follow suit with, like you've said, trying to use a material that is present there. That is not an accessible entry or exit, doesn't need to be. That is intended uh -huh. as um, the entry exit for employees, uh, staff entrance. Yeah. Um, so to your point, um, we do have to finalize that piece, Chris. <laughs> All right, I see Jane Wald has her hand up. So I suspect she'd like to comment on some. Yes, I have, I have one more question, Doug, but after Jane. Okay. Jane? Yes, this is this is only a comment on uh, what we know about the appearance of the building. There is a historic photograph from perhaps the 1870s or 1880s that does show the, uh, the if you zoom in on it, it does show the orientation of a carriage house with the gable ends on the east and the west. And um, if you'd like to see that, I'd be glad to show it. But I just want you to know that there is that that bit of evidence. Great. 
Thank you. I, I think we might have actually seen that at the local historic district commission uh, hearing because I seem to remember images. But the second question is um, the 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 fire uh, fire department have uh, given us a report, but it's uh, it reads more like a not so much a review of the of the of the applicant's design in terms of compliance with the needs of the department, but simply a list of everything that uh, should be done. And so I, I, my question is, I guess to uh, to you, Chris, uh, Chris Chamberlain. I realize now there's two Chris's here. Um, that uh, do we? Uh, I, mean, I didn't go through this and try and satisfy myself that all of the things that the fire department says is needed, which is the standard list of this is what we want. How much of that? And I imagine quite a lot of that and maybe all of it is already provided is is that the case that this is essentially a list of stuff that's already been done um yeah it 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 was almost just just a list of what's in the code um which uh we are actually following up with the fire department to clarify a couple of those points um the museum has coordinated with the fire department uh, a number of times um to ensure that um, access is provided the best it can. Um, in fact, they have uh, notes in their response plan, I believe uh, Jane said, as to the type of vehicle that can navigate the homestead driveway, which is um, relatively narrow and a little steeper than, than is ideal for apparatus. Um, so yes, I, I believe that uh, you know most, probably not all because of the nature of the site, but uh, most of those items are accounted for. And you know a number of them are construction logistics plans that need to be finalized um, as part of uh, you know the, the contractor getting on site. Um, but we are um, in the process of uh, trying to tie up loose ends on that um, and ensure that they're satisfied with their ability to access this part of the mm. site in an emergency. And, and uh, could I ask Chris Brestra whether it's, uh, Chris, is it reasonable for us as a board to expect that the uh, the department would review this with, a, uh, with regard to what's there and, and make comments about where they have troubles as opposed to just giving us this laundry list? I Which think is... that the um, fire department will review the construction plans, um, but uh, those have not been submitted yet. So when the building permit is being um, applied for, the fire department has an opportunity to review the site plans and the building plan and work with the building commissioner and his inspectors to make sure that everything mm. is provided for. But the, at the moment, this list is not very helpful to the planning board. It really is an indication that the fire department has looked at the plans and if they had a problem with what is being shown, they would um, remark on it in okay. that report. And so the fact that they're just listing what needs to be done, I don't think is really a problem. It's really, it's confirming to us that they've looked at the plans and they haven't seen anything uh, amiss. Um, and I, I would just add, you know, on, on many projects um, for the college, uh, the museum itself, um, the uh, we're working on Jones Library. We worked on the Valley CDC project on Northampton Road. Um, we, you know, the fire department has been very good about uh, coordinating over difficult sites that may not be able to meet the strict letter of um, of the NFPA fire code. Um, and so we're we're very confident that. Um, uh, we'll be able to finalize that to their satisfaction as the process moves forward. Thank but, you. But Chris, is it likely that, or is it reasonable for us to expect that there will be no significant changes to the site plan? Um, I would through, say... through the fire department review. I mean, what's the point in us looking at this if it's going to change a lot because of the fire department? Yeah, uh, I we are not anticipating um, significant changes to the uh, site plan again, based on that history of um, working on some of these sites. Okay, uh, you all set, Bruce? Okay, Janet. So Bruce raised the issue that I was concerned about because I went through the um, Trenton's Middle 
And it does look like a laundry list of like, this is what you have to do. You know, and one of my questions was like, how long is the driveway? Because you need to turn around if it's, you know, certain length and things like that. So I'm not very comfortable with um, the idea that, well, silence is assent and everything's okay. So I would, I would be more comfortable voting yes if I knew that the the fire department had looked at this. They know these regs and they don't see a problem. They don't need to turn around or they can back out. Um, I'm just not comfortable with, you know, thinking that if no one, if we haven't heard them say anything, then everything's okay. Because that has actually not always served the town well in the past. And so I wonder if we could ask Chris Bascom to look at these plans he knows this code inside and out and just say there's there's sufficient turnaround and you know i i don't really want to need to know exactly where the command center is in case there's a fire i mean i think that's sort of later down the road but just is this is this is this sufficient to get a truck in and get a truck out or the equipment you need to get on site um so i'd like to know that the other question i had was like this is going to potentially be kind of gathering space for educational programs I know I've gone to the Emily Dickinson Readathon, which is actually quite crowded in, in, a, in a fantastic way. And I, I, you know, one of the questions I raised at the site visit was, is there a parking management plan? I know these are two historic houses. People are in and out. They can't actually accept that many people. So I don't really think we need a traffic study, but I do think that it's very possible or, you know, if if the museum has large events on the grounds, there really isn't sufficient parking in the area if it was like a really crowded event. And I would love the museum to have very crowded events. I think it's like such an incredible gem. And I would like to see in a parking management plan, where could overflow parking go if you filled up the neighborhood and you filled up the, the parking spaces in front. And I had suggested that the Amherst College um, parking lot by the alumni house would just be very easy. You know, if you're having a very big event, then you can just direct people to park there. So that that's my my concern. And actually my hope is that the you know the museum gets busier and busier. Um, and so in fact the museum already does that. Um, they it is a case by case basis and at the discretion of the college depending on events that are going on. Um, but they do coordinate with the college request and typically receive permission to direct people to alumni lot for those largest events. Um, as you note, for day-to-day -day purposes, despite the fact that there's no parking on site, the hours when the museum is busiest are sort of different than the hours when street parking is the busiest, um, and that's generally not been an issue. Um, and we did submit some documentation today sort of uh, in support of the, the request uh, to waive the, the parking requirement, which is something like 107 spaces uh, on the property, which we obviously can't provide. Um, uh, just uh, noting, that um, the museum has a lot of communication out there um, on its website uh, available to people who call in um, and uh, and and through those sorts of means um, directing people you know notifying people to the fact that there is not parking directly on site um, directing them to park um, on the street or in municipal lots um, the closest municipal lots are within a quarter mile of the site um, and uh, and so they 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 do make uh, an effort to make sure that people are, are keenly aware um, of how they uh, need to arrive and access the site. All right, Chris. Chris, me. Chris me, Presser. Chris. Um, I wonder if Chris Chamberlain would take it upon himself to call or meet with um, Chris Bascom of the fire department and get him to answer Janet's questions. Um, but just a short transmittal to reassure the planning board that um, the fire department has adequate access to this site. And I think that's what Janet is looking for. Yeah. And and so uh, just to, to be more direct, um, the uh, college facilities department, which is assisting this um, project, is um, helping us to make that contact um, because they, they have good communication with the fire department, as you might imagine. So they have, uh, I understand there's a person here in the audience who is connected with the college. Mark Andrews, is he part of the college facilities department? Um, he is, yes. So he's overheard this conversation and he can work with yeah. you to get the appropriate reassurances about that. 
right? Yes, and and that is that process is underway. I believe that they started um, looking into that uh, yesterday or the day before. Thank so you. So Mark has his hand up. Why don't we allow him to speak? Mark, uh, you should be able to say, make a comment. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I, uh, we usually work through Rick Mears. He's our kind of historic contact with Amherst Fire Department. And um, I, I did just send him an email a few days ago. So that's still in progress. I sent him a text message because Rick likes to work crazy hours, but I haven't heard back yet. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris, uh, your hand is Chris Brestrup, your hand. I just stuck up. my hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that um, the planning board could count on getting a little note or something in writing from Chris Bascom or Rick. What's Rick's last name? Mears. It's Rick. It's Rick Mears. Mears. It would come through me anyway, and I can certainly forward it to you, Chris. That would be great. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Um, Nate, your hand is up. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. The only thing I see in the transmittal is that they want, you know, it's all a lot of it is about an access road and everything. So I, to me, looking at these plans, everything's sufficient. It may be that the beginning of the access road or the driveway is a little narrow. And so in other instances, the fire allows reinforced uh, shoulders if they need to put stabilizers down. And so where the drop off is at 16 feet wide all the way back to the turnaround, that's wide enough. Um, and so it might just be the beginning of the driveway needs to have reinforced shoulders, which Amherst College has done before below grades, so you don't see it and you can allow grass to grow. So, you know, reading through the points that Chris Bascom outlined, I don't see any other issues really. I mean, um, you know, there's water supply and everything else to me is just stuff that has to be, um, you know, complied with, but the only, my, the only thing I could see Thing that I could see changing is just you know reinforced shoulders along the driveway. Everything else would be kind of you know copacetic and just you know complied with as part of the project. All right. So um, Nate and Chris Brestrup, you know, I think in addition to uh, Mark Andrews working through uh, Rick Mears, you know, it might be useful for you to relay through your town communications that the planning board found the fire department comments to be somewhat unhelpful and um, just for their future reference. And so we don't have to wonder what they really mean by that. Um, Chris Brestrup, your hand is still up. Are you, are you, uh, is that a legacy? Okay, thank you. Um, Bruce Coldham. Um, one small further question. Um, I think this was because I read through the uh, suggested uh, uh, whatever. Uh, it has to do with bike racks. Uh, here we have a, a, essentially a reception, a visitor center, a, 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 which is formalizing the place for people to come who are visiting. And uh, I don't know whether there are bike uh racks elsewhere on the property. I don't know whether it doesn't seem as though it's the kind of uh, institution that would require a lot of bike racks, but it certainly seems like it, we should have some because some people are going to come here on bikes, I would think. And, and it would seem that uh, uh, the point of entry uh, should be a place where people can uh, safely leave their um, uh, and securely leave their their bicycles. So I don't see anything here. We didn't talk about it in the uh, on the site visit. Is there any plan to do that? Is there any reason why one wouldn't want to do it in the vicinity of this building? So um, I'll start with currently um, there is minimal bike traffic, but when um, they do arrive, people are directed to leave their bikes. Um, near the homestead uh, adjacent to those accessible parking spaces in that portion of the site. Um, and certainly the, uh, and so currently there is not a rack. Uh, the museum is open to providing one. They would prefer that to be um, a, a surface placed rack that could be removed um, for snow plowing. Um, we discussed the possibilities of putting a rack near this building and that could get tricky um 
we certainly wouldn't want it in front uh, or prominent uh, in front of this building for the historic preservation reasons. Um, but if it's off uh, of the sort of walking path, we typically like to specify racks off of a hard surface. Um, and that uh, leads us to um, so, you know, additional impacts that conservation has to deal with that that's not the end of the world. Um, but, you know, wasn't really an intention to create a lot of hardscape around this building. Um, so, and I say this as someone who gets around town on bikes, um, I, I think that, well, maybe not ideal uh, if that rack is placed a little bit distant from this new welcome point. Um, I think our proposal would be um, to place that um, over by the homestead in that existing sort of established parking area in order to more formalize that. All right. Uh, would you be open to that as a condition? Um, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, and as long as that's clear that that it would not be uh, mounted into the ground, there's just not a great way to do that. Um, but we'd get a substantial rack that can't walk away um, that, that could be moved out of the way for snow plowing purposes. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, any other comments from the board at this point? point. If not, I will go ahead and move to public comment. All right, so we we have 17 attendees still. And um, I guess the, at this point, it, do any of you from the public want to make comment on this project? Okay, it's uh, I'm not seeing any hands for this for comment on this project. All right, so um, Chris Brestrup, um, I believe you had recommended that we hold off on approving this project until the Conservation Commission has acted. Uh, is that true? I did recommend that, and now you can also say that you're um, going to be hearing potentially from the fire department. So those would be two reasons to hold off on approving this project. Um, okay. I did send some findings, some draft findings late in the day. So if you're inclined to do so, you could review the draft findings and then you know, go over them again the next time you meet on this, or you could just put those aside for now and have a chance to look at them you know, by yourselves and then come back to the meeting next time and, and talk about it. But they are out there in your inboxes if you're interested in doing that. Chris, um, assuming we continue the meeting now, uh, what date would you propose and how full is the agenda that evening? I would propose the date of May 15th. Um, and right now we have uh, Amherst Historical Preservation Plan um, discussion. Um, I think Nate would present that to you and then you would have a discussion about it. We have University Drive Housing Overlay District, and we have a proposal that Nate has put together uh, with your help. Um, so he would want to present that and have a discussion. And then uh, Janet um, recommended during one of the recent meetings that there be a discussion about housing issues. So we could put that on May 15th or we could put it on some other night. So anyway, May 15th is a possibility to have this project come back. The next um, possibility would be um, either May 29th, which would be a third meeting in May, or um, June 5th. Okay. Um, uh, Chris Chamberlain, um, what kind of timeline are you on? Uh, the museum is anxious to get the project underway as soon as possible. So I think our preference would be for the 15th. Um, and I don't know if if reviewing the findings now, um, you know, just saves some time next uh, next month while you've got a light agenda tonight. Um, you know that that seems like yeah. a possibility. Okay. Um, so, board members, are are you okay continuing and going along and continuing the discussion tonight and and going through the findings that Chris has drafted, Janet? 
Um, I haven't seen the findings, but I, I think that if we, um, I, I would suggest just waiting till the next meeting. I think it's going to be pretty short and I think we'll have a quick vote. Um, there might be changes to the project due to the um, conservation commission. And so I, you know, I think, I think basically if we could do it, we could probably could wrap it up pretty quickly in two weeks. But if we spend time going through conditions that no one's looked at on a project that might get modified, um, it doesn't seem super efficient to me. But if we got the conditions early and we all looked at them and you know maybe wrote to Chris on you know any suggestions for change, I think we could move pretty quickly at the next meeting. All right, thanks, Janet. Uh, anybody else have a comment? Anybody else want to proceed tonight? Bruce? Um, I was thinking we could proceed tonight, but I do understand the Janet's uh, observation. It's uh, Janet. It's not. It's not the conditions. We don't even have those yet. It's the uh, the findings that Chris has put together. So we we would be reviewing findings. I have looked at them, and they don't seem too contentious, uh, because this project is what we might call a pretty wholesome project. So I agree, it probably won't take us too long next time, and maybe we should wait. I'm in two minds, so I'd go either way. Uh -huh. Okay, well, it always seems to take a long time to read them all. So even if they're not controversial, it's a fairly lengthy process. Chris, press, uh, Chris Brestrup. So I wanted to make note of the fact that among the findings, I had some questions, and I think I've sent the findings to Chris Chamberlain for his review. If not, I'll make sure to do that, but he can follow up on some of those questions that I asked in the findings, and, and perhaps it would be best to wait until next time because things will be more resolved by then. Okay. All right. Uh, so we will wait. So at this point, um, I guess we need to put together a motion to continue this hearing to May 15th. Um, what time would you propose I think 6.35 would be fine if both Pam and Nate agree with that assessment. Yes. Pam agrees. Nate? I agree. You're, you're okay? Yeah, I agree. And I was also going to suggest that if the conditions and findings are available for two weeks, maybe we don't need to read them, all of them at the next hearing, right? So the ZBA doesn't. They'll approve them in categories or just approve them um, and not read them every line in the hearing. And I actually think that knowing that, as Bruce said, this is a wholesome project and the conditions will be there, you know, everyone can see them for two weeks with comments. I think that could expedite the review on the 15th. Okay. And I'll just chime in as someone who does this in a lot of different towns. That's actually the majority of, of boards um, operate that way. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, Chris Brestrup, at what point do you think you'll have uh, draft conditions? Will those come in advance of the meeting? I think I could definitely have them done by early next week. Okay, that would be good too. That way we've got everything and we can uh, send you any comments in advance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bruce, Bruce Colum. Um, Doug, hacking back to your uh description of the motion that needed to be moved, I would say so moved. So you are moving that we continue the hearing to May 15th at 6.35 p.m. Second. All right, thank you, Karen. Uh, any further conversation from the board? All right, we'll, we'll go through our roll call. Bruce. I approve. Fred. Aye. All right. Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. I'm an I as well. All right. Uh, Chris Chamberlain and Tim, thank you very much. Thank coming, you. Coming this Thank evening. I guess we'll see at least one of you in two weeks. Thank you. We'll see you then. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right. Um, the time now is 7.50, and we usually take a break around 8 o'clock. This seems like a an opportune moment. So why don't we take a five-minute break? Uh, 
turn off your cameras, mute yourself, uh, come back at 7.55 or 7.56, and uh, we'll see you then. Mm-hmm. 
Celtics are up by six. <laughs> okay, thanks, Janet. I'm starting not to like Bam. I when I figured his name is last name, but oh, it was so bad when he intentionally put his foot under Jason Tatum. That was well, not okay. On the first play of the game, I just saw a clip. He just pushed Al Horford over, just like shoved him over. And I, you know, he seems like a he's kind of a great player, but not lately. Yeah, right. I liked him up until last game, and now yeah. I don't like him anymore. <laughs> All right, so time is 7.56. Wait, I gotta get rid of this cat. Come on. Yep, let's get rid of our cats like I just did. Okay, come back. And we'll see if Fred is gonna come back soon. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, give give Fred one more minute, and then I'll go ahead and read the intro. for this next topic. All right, so my clock has turned to 7.59, so I think I'll just go ahead with the intro for this fourth item on our agenda this evening. Uh, planning board review and recommendation to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And this is regarding ZBA 2024, uh, it's my, 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 Cheat sheet says dash XX, which means it doesn't have a number yet. Chris, is that correct? It hadn't been assigned a number when we put this agenda together. And since then it has been assigned a number, but I can do a little bit of an explanation after you get through okay. with the introduction. All right. So the project is at 98 Fearing Street and the applicant is B and P LLC. Request special permit to construct a three unit apartment building, including 10 bedrooms under section 3.323 of the zoning bylaw and expand the parking area located behind the existing house, non-owner occupied, which is a non-owner occupied three family dwelling to 12 parking spaces, including one handicapped space for the residents of the existing, existing and proposed units. This is on map 11C, parcel 129 in the RG zoning district. Chris, uh, why don't you make your statement? So this project um, has been filed with the town, with the uh, town clerk, yes, and with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, and it was to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals um, later in May. Um, but it went to the local historic district commission the other night, and Nate can give you details about that, or perhaps Bruce or Karin can also do that. I think Karin's on that uh, group. Um, <clears throat> in any event, the local historic district 
um, was not favorable towards the project the way it was currently designed. And they had a lot of um, comments and criticisms. So the applicant has taken those to heart and is going back and is going to um, discuss, you know, the, the comments that they got and decide what they're going to do, if they're going to move forward or not. Um, so the applicant preferred not to present the project in its current form to the planning board tonight. However, you are free to discuss the project as you understand it, if you choose to do that. I see people in the audience who may want to speak about the project. Um, what is What has happened with the Local Historic District Commission is that um, that commission uh, continued its public hearing to a date, I believe it's in early June, if Nate uh, can confirm that. Um, and so um, by that time, the applicant and, the, and their design team will have figured out, you know, are they going to change this into something that would be more acceptable to a local historic district commission, or are they just going to withdraw it and figure out what they're going to do in the future? So that's the current status. So in any, any event, you're free to discuss it tonight if you choose to do so. Um, I wanted to point out that Jesse Major is an abutter to the property, and he has submitted um, comments. He's made it clear that his comments are submitted as a resident and not as a member of the planning board, and um, he's free to do that. He plans to recuse himself from any discussion that the planning board will have about this project. So you do have his comments in your packet, and or it, they were posted in the packet, and you have many other comments from other people who have opinions about this project. So I don't know if you want to hear from Nate or Bruce or Karen about the local historic district discussion, or if you just want to open it up for discussion yourselves. Well, I guess I'd like to start by asking the board, do you want to have a conversation about what is a, a project that's going to change? Uh, we could just not, we could just not talk about it and move on. Um, Karen? Um. I think there's so many people in the uh, public audience that have been waiting to make comments that I think it would be a good idea to listen to them. I think that what we have to say, we, we've we've read these comments, we've taken them to heart. Um, it probably is something that we don't need to discuss a whole lot because it's possible that the applicant will just withdraw this but I do think we should take some time to listen to the people that have uh, waited so long to chime in on this and feel so strongly about it. Okay, thanks, Karen. Bruce? Um, I agree with uh, Karen. Um, it's, um, and, and the comments that folks are likely to have are probably the same sort of comments that we've already heard on Monday. Uh, on Monday, we were, um, uh, chastening ourselves as the commission to constrain our our discussion to the uh, uh, to the the constraints that are um, in the bylaw that struck that basically gives us our our mandate. Um, the uh, issues that come before the zoning board are, are, are rather different. And in fact, uh, many of the concerns and so forth that were people wanted to discuss, and I think were restraining themselves from on uh, Monday would be, uh, uh, they would be unconstrained uh, this evening. So that might be why uh, many of them have decided to come back. Um, so for that reason, I think uh, we should give the public uh, comment period uh, a fair uh, slice. I don't know that I need to say too much more other than that this project came uh, first to the local historic district commission uh, a year and a month ago when it had, uh, I think, um, three duplexes. In other words, it was quite large and, and and it was quite shocking. And I remember my comments, which was kind of, I was gobsmacked that this was even possible, that uh, that this, and, and so I learned something about second principle uses at that meeting. And then again, at the one that uh, Michael Holden presented a little while later. This uh, that we looked at on Monday was, uh, um, was 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 uh, a less a lesser intensive 
uh, development of, of a second principal use, but nonetheless was still um, uh, of great concern to every single member of the commission uh, for more or less the same reasons, but not exactly the same reasons. Um, and the uh, there was an overwhelming uh, uh, commentary from the public, which uh, which is what I think we should allow to happen again tonight. Okay. Um, okay, so if we go ahead, then I, I, I think we should hear Bruce and Karin. Uh, can either of you summarize the kinds of comments that the local historic commission gave to the applicants? Um, I, yes, I, I... Go ahead, go ahead, Bruce. Uh, I would say that uh, um, from from Greta Wilcox to me would be the spectrum with uh, most people down with uh, along on Greta's side of the spectrum, which was um, they could possibly imagine a a single studio or probably nothing um, that this uh, house as a three family was already uh, uh, a, 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 an intensive use of the lot given the uh, the, the 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 fact that it was a rental, a student rental. Of course, that's not really our purview, but nonetheless, we couldn't filter that reality out from the conversation. Um, the the uh, the bulk of the the commission members were strongly to stridently opposed. Um, I think the basis of the uh, concern had to do with scale. I think the uh, everyone on the commission uh, was respectful, uh, somewhat uh, admiring of the architectural proposal, that it felt that it, at least as far as the design was concerned, was consistent uh, with the his historic uh, district commission objectives. It was the scale of the project and whether you felt the scale was in terms of the footprint or the mass of the building, or in my case, the uh, size of the parking lot, which was so much bigger even than anything, but still much less so than it was a year and a half ago. But still, it was. A, it was. We are mandated to uh, make judgments and determinations of appropriateness on the basis of scale, among a couple of other things. And I think it was the, it was the outlandish, uh, the uh, inconsistent scale of the project in, from various points of view, that uh, caused the commission to be. Uh, strongly to very strongly um, uh, disinclined to grant a certificate of appropriateness to the project. Karen, what, what would you add to yeah, that? And, and along with the fact uh, that this property has already uh, transitioned from owner-occupied three-family to uh, student-occupied and has had a very disruptive effect on the neighborhood as it is without any further uh, residents being added. The neighbor next door was reporting that the parking was insufficient as it is with, with just the three. And many times guests and other people that park have been on the lawn and encroaching on his own property. Um, I think the people in this neighborhood are really panicked that if we allow something like this to go, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the investors were unfairly in a way enticed to buy this property by uh, a realtor who who pretty much said, you know, you have the possibility of building two further houses. So uh, it, it's not surprising that an investor who knows the need of students and how much they pay would jump at the chance to uh, make a really wonderful investment here. But they should have somehow been warned that this is in a district, a historic district which is trying to preserve the residential na nature and it's a very fragile district. And if something as already is happening comes where, where there's so much increased noise and parking uh, disrupting this, there's going to be a domino effect and that's not to anybody's advantage. We're struggling to keep our schools supplied with children. There's We're trying to get families and children to remain in the town when there's an exodus, it's not to anybody's advantage, not the universities, not the residents. And this is a really important cornerstone 
in the way that we're going to go. So that's why I think so many people are here willing to talk and why our decision on what happens here uh, is crucial. And I would sort of remind the investors that preserving this as a beautiful house as it is uh, on, an, on a nice green piece of lawn is also a very valuable thing for the future. So you may be much better off uh, financially even if you pr help preserve this in the way that it is now. All right, thanks, Karen. So unless board members have any other comments right now, I will turn it to public comment. So we still have 14 members of the public present. Members of the public, this is the time if you want to make a comment on this project as it's currently constituted uh, for you to do that this evening. I will remind you that the planning board is not the approving body for this project. Um, the local historic district commission has pretty much a veto power over it and the ZBA uh, has the authority over it. Uh, planning board will can make a recommendation to ZBA, but it doesn't even have to do that. So uh, we may or may not be a useful group to hear your comments. All right, so I see one hand. Uh, Pam, if we could bring Ken Rosenthal over. And uh, if you're able to set up the three minute clock, that would be great. Welcome, Ken. And uh, please give us, repeat your name and give us your street address in Amherst and you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. And thank you, uh, Planning Board. Uh, Ken Rosenthal, 53 Sunset Avenue. I have written to you and asked you to please recommend, to give a, a no recommendation, a recommendation of no on this project. Uh, I wanna first mention a design flaw. Uh, I, I think by the way, they've chosen very good architects, but this is, if, if completed as, uh, proposed, and I know it may be changed, there would be six units. And according to town law, that would mean the possibility of four unrelated individuals. This location is certain to draw only students. And that means that there are likely, very likely to be 24 unrelated individuals living on this site. No matter how they have designed the parking area, it's inadequate. And it will not be able to accommodate the cars that would come with the 24 people, even if not everyone owns a car, and their occasional visitors. So that's a basic flaw that they are going to find impossible, almost impossible to beat. But more significantly than that, this is a neighborhood that many of us who live here want to see to support the university, but not to support it with students, to support it as a place where employees, staff, and faculty can live with their families year round and walk to work. It's an ideal place for that. And it has been for that, that way for so many years. Some of you, of course, know Rolf Karlstrom, who's the former chair of the biology department, who, who, who has uh, lived there and has touted it as a great place for faculty to live. And I submit other than faculty, also, also staff. But more than that, it's also a neighborhood that attracts people like me. I, I came to retire to Amherst and I wanted to be close to the center of town. I wanted to be close to the university. And I, I live on Sunset Avenue, not very far from this location. So I'm hopeful that the planning board and the planning department will see that we should find ways to encourage the, that residents in this area of, through their housing be year round residents, people whose cars are registered in town and who will want to live here and shop here year round. Thank you for listening to me this evening. All right, Ken. Thank you. Uh, I see a second hand from Melissa Ferris. Pam, if you could bring over Melissa. Welcome, Melissa. Uh, you can unmute yourself and give us your name and your street address. Hi, I'm Melissa Ferris. I'm here with my husband, Graham Caldwell. Hi. We, we are at 285 Lincoln, and we are one of the abutters to this property. Um, I, I do also want to identify myself. I am a currently enrolled UMass student as well. Um, and so this, this isn't just about, um, you know, students versus year-round residents for me. 
it's about the crowding of this lot um, and the enormous size of this building that these developers want to put up. It's got a 2,000 square foot footprint um, as opposed to the current house, which is already quite large, it has about a, I think it was 1,200 square foot uh, footprint. So this is going to take up an enormous amount of the lot, as is the paving. And this is right on the Tan Brook. So there have been drainage issues um, for a lot of the properties right around here. There's been flooding at the, the house on the opposite side of this on Fearing Street, basement flooding and stuff. So we're, we're I think, understandably concerned about what the paving of like a third of this lot can do to all of the surrounding areas. Um, but this house is gonna loom over the backyards of several properties. They're gonna be able to look directly into, you know, our home. <laughs> um, it's, we, uh, for, similar to what Ken was saying, we just recently moved here. We've only been here, we haven't even been here for two years. We selected a house in this neighborhood because we wanted to be in a place that was close to town, but that where the houses had breathing room, as opposed to moving to say Northampton, where the houses are significantly closer together in the downtown area. We selected this place very specifically for the breathing space and the buffer zones between the homes. And this would take that away. This would probably result in people like us selling our house and leaving. And if we do that, the only people who are going to buy a house right next to a development are going to be other developers. So I, I think this really will create a domino effect in the historic district if this um, development is permitted that will result in a very different tenor than the one that made us want to come here. Um, also, the, all of these, the houses around us, like these blocks between um, Lincoln and Fearing and, and Page, have all have the, the, the houses are all on the street facing side. So there's like a, a sort of communal shared green space behind them, which is really lovely. And there's, you know, thing you get to see like wildlife and stuff. And this project is like dead in the center of that. So it kind of affects everyone. And like, frankly, we are in terror of this, <laughs> of this project going forward in, in any capacity, really. I mean, it's right next to our house. Okay, we're, the, we're running out of, out of time. Okay, Sorry, I okay. pushed that up, thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Melissa, and uh, I think it was Caldwell. Uh, yes. <laughs> all right, thank you both. Uh, the next person is Jennifer Taub. Pam, if you can bring her over. Uh, hello, Jennifer. Um, hello. Back. And, yeah. uh, th thank you. Um, so I'm Jennifer Taub at 259 Lincoln Avenue, and I'm speaking as a resident, and I would, you know, concur with everything that uh, Graham and Melissa and Ken Rosenthal have said. So I don't want to repeat that, but would just like to also emphasize that um, although this may you know, appear the lot at 98 Fearing has some depth, but actually the lots are very narrow. So there's already, as everyone said, a triplex that's currently standing on the lot and they're proposing to add basically an apartment building behind it. These lots are very narrow. So to have 20 to 24 students and the LLC that owns it has been clear that they're intending to rent it to students. So it will be, and in our neighborhood, although we're close to the campus, for every student um, resident in, in a house or duplex in our neighborhood, there's a car for every student. So they, they have their cars because that's how they get back and forth to Amherst from their hometowns. So even though they can walk to class, they still have cars. And the um, again, the the owner of the property has been very upfront about the fact that this is who they intend their tenants to be. It's not to provide housing for families or other year-round non-student households. And while we certainly welcome accessory dwelling units, and there are a number of them in our RG neighborhood, um, this is not that because the second unit that's being proposed to be built, the apartment building, is actually larger than the current triplex already on the lot. You know, with an ADU, which can exceed a thousand square feet, and the owner has to reside in either the accessory or primary unit, that's something we 
you know, wholeheartedly support and welcome in the neighborhood, but but this is not that. Um, the other concern, you know, for those who may not be familiar with the actual lot, Fearing Street, the backyards back up onto Cosby Street, Lincoln and Page. So this development will impact residents on four streets. So in terms of a domino effect and pushing people out of the neighborhood, you're talking about Fearing Street, Lincoln Avenue, Page, and Cosby will all be directly impacted and it will be a much less appealing place for all of the families with children that live and send children to our public schools that live in, in this neighborhood. And the other thing I wanna add is that the parking, I mean, part of what's so frankly um, objectionable about this is they're literally proposing to put in a parking lot on the middle of a residential street. There's an, um, because the lots are narrow, all the driveways on the street, they're just the width of a single car. Jennifer, so, you're, you're up to three minutes. So oh, I'm sorry. Anyway, that, that's a lot of cars to get in up. and out of a single driveway. And there's no on-street parking on Fearing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Roger at 26 Cosby Ave. Roger, if you could give us your full name and repeat your address. Good evening, thanks for having me. I'm Roger Matledge at 26 Cosby Ave with my wife, Patricia Brinkman, who's also on, on another machine um, in the neighboring room. Um, I just wanted, I, this is my first time doing this, so I'm not sure you are, I thought you're here tonight to see about issuing a variance, is that true? No, in fact, we are a, an ancillary or a, a related body to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So when we are allowed to make recommendations to the zoning board, but they are the deciding body. So uh, although we're interested in your comments, we will not be the ones who actually decide uh, what is allowed to be built on this lot. Okay. okay. Um, so, so I don't- you, know. you, could, you could consider that we're, we're the warm up act yeah. Okay. And so you can try out your comments on us and refine them for the zoning board. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your patience for doing this. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know if you've seen my comments. It's M-A-T-T-L-A-D-G-E misspelled, but that's okay. Um, but I I carefully mapped out um, the area that we're talking about. And it's, it's actually fearing Lincoln, Cosby, Page, and Beston all have this green space behind them um, that is affected. And, and so as every, I won't repeat what everybody else has said, but we're all in terror of this. Um, I'd also mention that it's really interesting how the presentation has of the developers and the architects make it look like this building is out in the, in the plains of, of Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> it does not, the renderings do not show uh, at all. And they've very carefully not shown some things. Um, also, there it says it's a 12 space parking lot. It's actually a 13 space parking lot, which includes a handicap, but there's also a space next to the garage that's not marked as one, which is another one. So there's actually 14 parking spaces there. So, um, and I don't think I need to say anything else that other people have said that would, would be useful and take up your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, any any other members of the public who want to comment? All right, we have Priscilla White. Pam, if we can bring over Priscilla. Priscilla, if, welcome. You have three minutes. If you could give us your street address and, and confirm your name. Hi, Priscilla White, 318 Lincoln Ave. And um, I just wanted to uh, speak up on behalf of the people who are living surrounding 98 Fearing Street, um, because I've been in a similar situation around the corner from them. I live in the 300 block of Lincoln. And um, over the last 20 something years, one by one, the houses have um, gone from being 
family owned. When I moved here, there were 10 children, two, two three generation families, um, and a mix of families and, and students, which felt like a, a good balance. And one by one, the houses were, uh, people moved, they went on the market and they were bought very quickly by developers. And um, to the point where we're the only family left and I had to make a very painful decision to move. We had hoped to age in place here, but, um, but it's been impossible to do that because of the change over the years. And I'm just bringing this up because I think it's important that uh, the scale of this is a, the scale of a commercial endeavor. And, and these, from the historic point of view, these houses were built as single family homes or sometimes owner occupied two family homes. And, um, and to preserve some of that character in the neighborhood is really important. You know, I, I don't stand to gain or lose, but I just felt I'd like to speak up on behalf of the people on those five streets surrounding this property who do stand to lose as I have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Priscilla. Anyone else? All right. Um, Chris, do you need to interject? I see another hand. Go ahead with the other hand. Okay. Uh, let's bring over Pat Brinkman. Welcome, Pat. Hi. I think I've unmuted. Yes, you are. You have three minutes. Thanks. I'm and I live with Roger Mallage, who is in the other room facing 98 Fearing. And we're one of the four um, small lots directly behind a budding. And I guess I can't add anything more to people who have already said stuff. Yes, I am panicked. I've already started making plans to sell the house. I love my neighbors. I love living here. We also retired and came here at the beginning of the pandemic. It was very quiet here. The reason we came here, we'd sold our house on over an acre in, the house, in a town with two acres zoning um, to move to Connecticut. And that didn't pan out. But so we came here not owning a house, having a lot of money in the bank, but not a lot. And we were lucky because we were shown four houses, two that were rentals that were available and two that were for sale, which we didn't know we would buy. But the rental, the real estate agent said, you know what, based on what you said, I think that even though this house is way over your price line, you may kind of want to look at it anyway. So we did. We came here to 26 Cosby back in March, as you know, at the beginning of the pandemic. It's very quiet. It was very weird. And it, we, we fell in love and we decided to move here. We get, let the student who was living here, we gave him like two months to find another place to live. And then we moved in and done a lot of work since then. And we really want to stay. Um, and, and other people have said things about, you know, the wildlife in the area, you know, besides the owls and stuff, we also see bear. We saw a bobcat the other day. We have skunks living under our deck. We have a wonderful green space here area that's shared and a wonderful community. And we've had a potluck apparently Sunday brunch that's been going on for 30 years that we go to every month. So we love this neighborhood and we want to stay. But if this happens, um, I, I don't think we can. I mean, I just don't know how, because I, I love what Priscilla said. I've heard that from so many people. I met the woman who lived on Sunset and the Bunsen Library. And I was like, I love living here. And she goes, yeah, but you don't know Amherst like I do. The hockey house is across is in my neighborhood. And before I knew it, all of a sudden she was gone. And now we do have um, a new development there right across from the Southwest. So we have a lot of nice houses over there. Anyway, I think my time is up, but I just urge you to really just hear, hear the, the sadness. And, and those of us who live here now, 
who can't stay here because we now we love the students, but we have really seen the worst of the worst of the couple of very few. Bye. Thanks. Check. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Anyone else? All right. All right. I'm not seeing any more hands. Chris, uh, did you want to say something? I just wondered what you were thinking um, of doing with the comments that you've heard in the uh, discussion that you've had. And um, right now, it's unclear whether these applicants are going to move ahead with their Zoning Board of Appeals um, application. They may, but they may not. So do you want to put anything together for them in terms of a recommendation for the Zoning Board of Appeals in case they do review this project? Or do you want to wait and see what happens? And, you know, there may be, uh, the, the project may evolve into something else and then you can comment. Yeah, so I'm just trying to get a sense of- I mean, I, I, this. personally, I feel like we should wait. Um, you know, I mean, it may never come to the ZBA, in which case, you know, asking you to put together some minutes of this conversation, or, you know, I'm sure you'll include some of this in the regular minutes of this meeting. Uh, but but going beyond that at this point feels kind of uh, unnecessary, you know, and not, you know, why put it together if we're never going to be able to give it to anyone? Um, you know, and most of the comments we heard this evening were not about the project per se. Uh, the details of the project. It was really about the fundamental idea of putting a building of that size on that lot. Okay, so I see three hands from board members. Janet? Um, Doug, I agree with you that we don't, we shouldn't do a recommendation to the ZBA on a project that may not take place. Um, um, but I, I'm actually glad that this is on the agenda. I'm really always want to hear from the public, particularly people who are sort of in the front lines of, you know, one of the fundamental issues of Amherst, which is student housing, where it should go and the impacts on non-students. And so, you know, when I looked at this project, I have questions about, you know, can you have two principal uses on the same lot? I've been hearing that you can't do that, except for in some very specific situations. This looks like that would violate that. And so I'd like to know more about the law on that. Um, but we're not discussing that. But it's like, you know, I I, I know the ZBA has pushed back on some projects like that. Um, you know, I went to 98 Fearing Street, and I also drove down Allen Street and Phillip Street, um, and all the parts of, you know, Sunset Street that was um, close to, the, to UMass. And, you know, those streets are mostly not, not fearing, but parts of fearing, I would say are sort of gone to just student housing. Um, the condition of the houses, many of the houses is very kind of worn down and beat up. There were beer pong tables, there's, there's chairs and garbage. And, you know, this has been happening closer to me on Shumway Street, South Whitney Street on Route 9 from like Amherst College down to Southeast Street. Um, Main Street used to be all families. I, someone in town meeting got up and said, when I grew up here, Main Street was filled with families and now it's mostly student housing, a lot of it pretty run down. You know, we can address the rundown issue, you know, by, you know, forcing the code or another bylaw, but it's the quality of life and, you know, you know, it's we have to figure out as a planning board and as a town, as a town council, how we coexist in a way that it's not detrimental. And so, you know, this is why we need to have the housing discussion, but not just a discussion, but actual solutions to how to figure out that everybody should be able to live in a neighborhood, but it has to be a mix and it can't be predominantly students. It can't be investor owned and, you know, I, I just, you know, I've heard people talk like I was just at brunch with my old neighbors, one of our mutual friends who was living on Shumway Street, his whole street, he owned his house, whole street turned to student housing, constant partying, and he left. And I, I do we, is that the kind of town that we want where you can stay if you're insulated? You know, I, I live next to, you know, hundreds of acres of land. Um, I do live in a, a neighborhood with rental housing, but it's, you know, the minority. 
Um, and I live in a neighborhood that has small houses that are very attractive to investors for rental houses. And so let's figure it out with very concrete proposals and let's, you know, take a step forward as a board, as a town to adopt changes to our code that will lead to a, like some harmony and we, we can all live together. So. All right. Thank you, Janet. Karen? I think that we should uh, have some minutes about the comments that we've been hearing. I think these heartfelt, uh, uh, urgent panic comments are something that we should take note of. And we can, you know, we can't make a recommendation what hasn't been submitted, but we can certainly echo the local historic uh, commission to say that this is really inappropriate, that this is a neighborhood that is trying to preserve itself. And if you're not gonna have family uh, uh, owned ownership on a property, you have to severely limit uh, the amount of uh, dwellings that, that are going to be, because as we can see that what's already happened with this particular house is already causing a disturbance. So I, I think we should weigh in a little bit on that we uh, concur with the local historic commission in saying that this is inappropriate as it is planned and it has to be severely cur uh, curtailed before it would ever be anything that we could recommend. Thank you, Karen. Um, Fred, you're next, but Chris, you've put up your hand. Did you want to interject something? Yeah, I wanted to say that the local historic commission has not um, made a determination about this yet. And it may be that um, the project is withdrawn. So um, I guess my recommendation would be to hold off on the planning board making a recommendation until there was something to um, make the recommendation about. You know, the project, if it goes forward, is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Maybe you will still be opposed to it. Maybe the local historic district will still be opposed to it. But to make a recommendation right now on something that is not um, not solid, not formed, is um, potentially not not useful. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say. <clears throat> thank you. Fred, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, for me, this is deja vu all over again. Back in the uh, uh, early 90s, uh, I recall being part of this uh, kind of a, of a problem. And uh, uh, I was instrumental. In fact, I invented footnote M. And I brought it in by petition. This was back when we had a town meeting. I brought it in by petition. The... Uh, uh, planning staff didn't particularly like it, uh, but uh, it uh, it addressed the problem. It was it, it used, however, a metric of six thousand square feet. Somehow that has been emasculated and it now reads four thousand. It should go back to six thousand. This is an absolutely classic example. Uh, when it came to a vote in a representative town meeting, which was famous for never passing, achieving a two-thirds vote on zoning bylaw amendments, that uh, zoning amendment passed unanimously. The town wanted it, and I submit the town wants to address this, and we need to do it. I did some research. I looked at the uh, the parcels all around this uh, on uh, Faring Street, and uh, it was very interesting. Um, I uh, I looked at the areas of each and uh, how that they would uh, what they were uh, 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 threatened with. Right now, uh, if you look at the uh, the uh, street. A Faring Street between Lincoln Avenue and um, um, the uh, I just blanked on it the the oh the uh, 
east, the, the north south street off the next one off of uh, Faring Street. I'm sorry. No, no, the other way going, uh, going east. Um, Allen Street. Triangle. No. North Pleasant. North Pleasant. No, no, no that's too far. Uh, um, Allen Phillips. Um, Cosby. <laughs> what is it? That's <laughs> Allen. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, it's not Allen. It's the next one down from Allen. Yes, yes. Oh, I think when I was I there, H something. When huh? I was there, there was no sign on that street. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I uh, I went there, and there are uh, in that uh, section there. There's uh, one building that's owned by UMass. It doesn't count. There's uh, nine single families. There's one three family, and there's two two families. This is completely out of character, and it, I think it uh, can be attacked at the ZBA under the uh, uh, consistent character uh, uh, requirements that are in the bylaw. But it really sh should be, if if we still have footnote N the way I put it into the bylaw, this would not have happened. Uh, at most, there could be one additional unit. But because footnote M has been emasculated, uh, this becomes possible. And this is how, and this, presents a policy issue that the planning board needs to think about uh, as we go forward on uh, looking at, uh, at housing issues. All right, thank you, Fred. Uh, Bruce, you are next. Um, so far as minuting this, uh, I, I could simply suggest that um, almost everybody who spoke tonight, we have a letter from and, and they're, they're fairly lengthy and well articulate letters. Uh, there are eight of them that I have in my file that uh, Chris has forwarded. And I think uh, re referencing those letters would be quite sufficient. Thanks, Bruce. Janet? So I, I think what Fred is talking about is something that we need to talk about is even with footnote and M, emasculated, we're looking at seven units per acre in the RG. Um, in the RN, it's four units an acre. And, you know, we're increasing density through, you know, uh, mixed use buildings in the village centers and downtown. That was the plan. But is the plan really to fill every acre lot in the RG with seven units? And I think, you know, I, I've always admired the pluck of that in some ways, like, yeah, we accept the density. But when we see what it looks like on the ground, is that what we want for that neighborhood? And I think the answer is no, we're gonna lose those neighborhoods. We're gonna lose the communities that are there. Um, you know, I, you know, people who are students live in those neighborhoods and like them because they're green, they're not super dense. And so I actually think we need to reduce the density in our neighborhoods, in our you know, RNs and RGs and the trade-off is increased density in the village centers. And I think that's just something we have to look at. I just don't think, and I also don't think like people, you know, in RN or RG say, oh, I'll buy a house and I'll build six units and I'll owner occupy and run my, you know, apartment building. It's not something that people normally do when they buy a residence. They might buy a triplex. They might convert to a triplex. They might buy a duplex. And they're not going to buy a, you know, I don't know what a six, you know, sixplex is, and and run that. That's just not that's not really realistic in terms of what's going to happen. Is is that those neighborhoods will become converted to basically commercial properties, and we're going to lose something in the town, which is the residents who contribute to us. And you know, I'm not anti-student in any way, but nothing in our master plan or in logic says let's let's lose street after street to investor housing and students and, you know, behavior. Okay, Chris. So I wanted to suggest that, um, you know, Pam and I take pretty good notes, especially Pam, and um, we create minutes. And so we're gonna have a pretty detailed uh, rendition of this meeting, including the comments that were made by uh, members of the um, attendees who wanted to speak. And we also have those letters. And so 
when the time comes that this does actually go before the Zoning Board of Appeals, you know, we could put together a little package of letters and comments and things that we heard from the public and send it to the ZBA. Well, the I assume hand, if, it, if it comes to the ZBA again, we'll have a chance to see it again. You will, yes. So, you know, we may have a whole different set of comments and public members who commented, so, you know. So I guess that what I'm trying to say is we, we have a pretty good record of what was said tonight. And then okay. eventually you'll have to figure out what to do with it. Um, and what you might do with it is just if the project goes ahead, have them come back, have them actually make a presentation to you in whatever form it is, and then make your recommendation. I don't think we yep. should put together a package now because there's no no end goal. There's no one to send it to. The CBA isn't going to be looking at this at least for a while. Right. Okay. That, I mean, that makes sense to me. Okay. Um, I see no hands from the board or the public. Time is 8.47. And so I think we can move on to the next item on our agenda. Old business. First item, uh, we wanted to have a brief discussion about the letter that Pam or that uh, Chris sent to the to the ZBA regarding the Shootsbury Road Solar Project. Uh, Chris, I'll let you start. Yeah. So I wanted to apologize to the board for my mishandling of this um, letter. Um, I I sent I I created a draft based on the October fourth uh, meeting minutes. And I sent it to Doug for his review, thinking I may just send it to Doug. And then two hours later, I said to myself, oh, I should probably send it to the whole board. And so that's what I did. And Doug sent me back some comments um, suggesting that I condense part of the letter, which I did. And then um, I sent the revised letter out to all the planning board members. Um, and then, so that was uh, Thursday, Thursday morning, I sent the revised letter out to the planning board members. What I didn't do, so first of all, I shouldn't have sent it to Doug and then sent it to the planning board. I should have made a choice and I probably should have just sent it right to the, all the planning board members. Second thing is I should have said in my email to you, please give me your comments by X time on X date. And I didn't do that. So, um, Janet sent edits to me on Friday morning. And when I got those edits, I sent them to Doug to see what he thought. And he didn't have time to deal with this because he works. So he said, well, either send my revisions as I had outlined them a day or two ago, or wait until Monday. But we here in the planning department were struggling to put together a package for the um, Zoning Board of Appeals, which was going to be hearing about the Shootsbury Road project. And so we felt um, pressure to get the letter out in the ZBA packet on Friday. So then Janet sent an email back, you know, expressing disappointment that her uh, comments, which I had received on Friday morning, didn't get put into the letter. So it was a comedy of errors or a comedy of horrors or however you want to characterize it. Anyway, I take responsibility for the lack of coordination and for the poor um, handling of the um, of the letter and the edits and I apologize to you. All right and and I for my part in the in the uh, in the in the process, um, it turns out that between between the Wednesday, uh, draft and the Thursday draft, the comments that I had made were on the last paragraph of her first draft. So we had actually already condensed uh, the first draft to get to the second draft. And then Janet, your comments were in fact on that same paragraph, uh, expanding it again. So I felt like Chris and I had already agreed that it could be condensed. So within the time that I had to think about it, it was like, we've already, we've already dealt with that. And um, I thought the two of us had agreed on that that was uh, 
uh, an improvement over the first draft. So that was the reason for my recommendation that we just issue where, where we were Friday morning. Um, I will say, you know, I, I view that as, you know, all of these letters that are signed by Chris, they are ultimately Chris's letters. And she can ask for advice from me, from all of us, and she can disregard all of it. So, um, you know, unless it's a letter that you are signing or I am signing, you know, it's really up to Chris. And um, she has a timeline to meet. And um, so, you know, that's the way it panned out. But, um, you know, I think it was unfortunate on a number of, of, of levels. And I hope we don't have the problem again, but that that's the way, that's the way it went. Uh, Janet, do you want to comment? Yeah, you know, I, you know, we, I, I appreciate the explanation and the confusion and the timing issue. Um, you know, I just think we need sort of clear, like, a clear process for, you know, planning board reports to town council on zoning amendments. And then if we're sending comments to the ZBA, what's the process, who signs off on what? And I, I think Bruce is the one who said, you know, he wanted to see the comments that we want, we should, that all these comments should be sent to the planning board. And then I saw that Chris asked for comments. And so I just think we need like clear processes. We know who's the final, you know, who's the decider. Um, and you know, and then it, it happens. And I, you know, I, you know, there's been situations where planning board reports to town council on zoning amendments went to town council without the zoning, the planning board reading it or having time to comment on it. And so I just, I just think we need to get consistency and clarity about what is the process, who's deciding what and the timing of it. Um, so, but I do appreciate the comedy of errors because, you know, we live in that world. You know, personally, I spent a year and a half on the solar bylaw working group. I did tons of research. I, um, you know, talked to tons of people, planning directors. Um, I read tons of documents, brought in experts. And so I really felt like, you know, I, I really felt like I have some expertise and I really think these are important issues for the, um, the ZBA to look at, particularly since it's forest land. And that was really a key um, issue for us. I really want the ZBA to read Eric Jake's comments on the draft water supply protection report, which you know no one would see if you read the final report. But she wrote like four or five pages of comments about the impacts of you know removing you know taking trees off of land, the impacts on water, on the soils, you know the solar arrays, heating. So I mean she she really put a huge amount of time in it, and that that comment seems to disappear. And I just really wanted you know, these very specific things that I had learned about that would relate to solar arrays and forest land to go in. And so I actually appreciate that you're working and you're just like, oh, we just did this, but, you know, and maybe didn't take the time to think like, oh, why is she saying these weirdly specific things? But these are issues that we had talked over and foresters from the Harvard forest that were important. And so, you know, I, so I appreciate the explanation because I just kind of thought, why did I spend a half hour doing this? And not, you know, no one even knew, but I realize now it's just sort of passed in the, in in the email chains and stuff like that. So I appreciate that. All right. Well, we'll try to do better next time. All right. Um, unless anybody else wants to comment on that topic, we'll we can move on. All right. Uh, old business. Um, any topics not reasonably anticipated? No. All right. Um, new business. Likewise, new new unexpected topics. No. All right. Form A A and R subdivision projects applications. Nope. Nothing. Nope. Maybe I, about... did I? Did I might want to report to you about something that there was okay. an A R that was connected with um, the. Ball Lane um, multifamily or what whatever it was duplex project that went through conservation um, went through the zoning board of appeals. Did I talk to you about that at all? Because there was a little uh, lot that was created out of that parcel 
that the Zoning Board of Appeals um, agreed could be covered by the comprehensive permit. And so it was actually uh, endorsed by the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I wanted to tell you about that because it is different from the way we normally do a and R. So you might find that a and R at the registry and you might wonder, well, why was that signed by the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals instead of the Planning Board chair? And the reason is because it was, um, they authorized the creation of that lot and we checked it with KP law to make sure that that was the right way to do it. And they said, yes, it can be done that way because it's part of a comprehensive permit. So I just wanted to let you know right. that that's a little different from what we normally do. Well, I'll, thanks. Next time I'm looking through ANRs at the registry, I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Uh, how about upcoming ZBA applications? Any any others than, than we've already talked about tonight? Hey, Chris, Nate? Uh, Ron Laverdier is proposing a mixed-use building, uh, you know, next to his 417 West Street property down near Amherst uh, Office Park. It's it's to the north. It's actually where uh, there's there had been a ranch house. It's behind that. Um, you know, it requires a special permit from the zoning board because of the districts it, it's in. I don't know if that's anything that's you know the planning board would want to see. It's a you know, nine-unit building with um, non-residential space on the first floor or you know, um, first or, you know, yeah, I guess we consider it the first floor. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. So you might want to look at that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's going to be building up that village center. Okay. All right. Um, how about upcoming SPP, SPR, and SUB applications? I can't think of any right now, but that's not because there aren't any. If I think of them tomorrow, I'll tell you about that. Okay. All right. Moving on to committee and liaison reports. Je uh, Bruce, anything on P Pioneer Valley Planning Commission? Uh, nothing to report. All right. Uh, I don't, I think I, I think I saw maybe today in my inbox uh, something an update from the chair of the CPAC committee, but I haven't read it yet. So uh, I can report on that next time if, if it seems significant. Karen, anything on DRB? Uh, yep, we met um, this week and some of the things were easy to, to um, address quickly. There's going to be uh, at the Paradise of India, a new awning that we approved and then, interestingly, at the park, at the playground, uh, there we reviewed um, something called the Portland Loo, which is going to be a, a um, restroom that they're proposing to put in. And um, it's a very interesting structure. It just kind of gets plopped in. Um, it's not totally unappropriate unattractive but it is very utilitarian and so the design review committee asked them to come back with uh, maybe some alternatives of location where it might fit in a little bit better and for those of you that are interested I mean this is kind of an important thing that the park is going to be adorned with um, a Portland Lou you might walk there and sort of look at it and see uh, what what you think or at any rate it seems like a good solution from many aspects but we just want to see where is it going to look the best that's that was the most interesting part of our meeting and then the uh common where we also wanted to be a little bit more um specific that we would prefer the paths on the common to be uh, oil and stone rather than the asphalt, which is proposed, but we're not sure that's possible because it's a matter of cost and maintenance. But the design review board uh, did all sort of concur that we would prefer that look. All right, thanks, Karen. Uh, I saw two hands come up during Karen's comments. Janet? 
So I'm glad to hear there's going to be toilet facilities near the Kendrick Park. I remember we talked about that. I thought that was really important. It is not the most attractive thing. Is there a way to like paint it like those transformers downtown to make it just an art object? Um, yeah. And I, I also would prefer the crushed stone. I think asphalt would be kind of tacky, you know, in what could be a really attractive, you know, add to our town. So, so quickly, right. I'll yeah. just say that the, the, um, that restroom facility on Kendrick Park will probably have to come before the planning board for a site plan review. Ah. You know, so I think that's something that uh, Bob Parent, the capital products manager for the town is preparing. So that would be an upcoming one. Uh, you know, it, the, the, if you want to, you can go to the, you can go to the design review packet um, for this week for the 29th of April and the documents are there. It's visible. I mean, I, I've, uh, so they're online for anyone to look at, but it, it would be coming to the planning board for review. Okay. Uh, Fred, you had your hand up. Are you no longer interested? Well, in well I, I uh, was, I, I didn't catch the first time around that it was Kendrick Park. I wanted to clarify that it was. And thank you. Uh, and uh, as someone who does grandfather duty uh, at the, uh, town parks uh, 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 that is definitely needed and so I was glad to hear that okay all right all right and then um, Chris anything from CRC we should know about yes the CRC has um, been looking at the solar bylaw and um, I think that they've looked at it three times we had a meeting this past Tuesday we had one on April 9th and one on March 26th um, Anyway, the idea currently is that the solar bylaw may have things in it as drafted that really should be um, in either planning board or zoning board of appeals rules and regulations, such as submittal requirements. Um, and it may have some things in it that should be more boilerplate conditions than things that are contained in the zoning bylaw. And it may also have... Um, material in it that is very supportive of what the solar bylaw is requiring, but may not be appropriate to put in the bylaw and might be more appropriate to put in a memo to town council. So the community resources committee is working through all of these things now, and then they're going to start to um, really look at the language of, of the bylaw. Right now, they haven't changed the language at all, but if you want to get a sense of what they're proposing to do, you can look at the CRC packet for um, Tuesday, April 30th, and that would give you a sense of what of what's going on there. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll be continuing that discussion moving forward. Okay. Great. Um, time is 9.04. We're up to the report of chair. Uh, I don't have anything to report. About you, Chris, anything, uh, report of staff? Report of staff, yes. I had a very joyful report to you when I reported that we were going to be hiring a planner um, and she's gonna be starting on May 6th, but now I have some unjoyful <laughs> reporting to do. Um, our staff person for the Zoning Board of Appeals and the DRB, who is Rob Wachilla, has announced that he's going to be working for the town or city of East Longmeadow. Um, he's going to become their planning director. So once again, we're going to have um, a vacancy in our staff and Nate and I and Pam um, will carry on. But um, it's, it's a very sad thing that I'm telling you because I really like the guy and I liked his work and I think he's energetic and smart and I'm going to be missing him. But that's why East Longmeadow wanted him. So anyway, we will carry on. Okay. You win some, you lose some. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, anything else from anyone? Time is 9.05. If not, uh, we can adjourn. I guess our next meeting, Chris, is the 15th. Next meeting is the 15th. Yes. Uh, Fred, I see your hand. Uh, just to uh, the, the street I was reaching for is Nutting Avenue. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I thought that okay. my mind. Very good. 
All right, on that note, thank you for joining and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, good night.